change too. The, the Congress government would like to raise it to 49, and the BJP is saying, gotcha. So let's see what happens with the national elections, but I'm very confident that we're going to see a 49% FDI increase very shortly in the new government. I think the government has always been keen to increase it. The current government has been keen to increase it to 49%. The bill was pa uh, tabled in parliament. One house passed it. The other house is sort of, you know, it's just on there. Uh, and just to keep one thing in mind, if I may add, uh, on the issue on uh, agriculture and that we are seeing at the WTO, certain positions were taken on agriculture. And I just want to keep one statistic in mind that the vast majority of India's population is actually dependent on agriculture and most of them are subsistence farmers. In 2012, agriculture accounted for 47% of the employment in India. Thank you. Okay, my time has expired. Uh, Mr. Pinkham's next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank all of you for being here today, despite the weather challenges. Uh, I want to begin with Ms. Dempsey uh, and ask you to elaborate, if you will, on how Indian market access and competition policies affect the U.S. market. In other words, affect what's going on here for your members. Thank you, India as a market, uh, as a market for exports, as a trading partner, is really underperforming. Yes, we've seen growth on both sides, although that growth has mostly been in imports from India. A lot of the growth in U.S. exports to India has been our largest manufacturers in the aerospace sector. What we've seen is a market where uh, U.S. producers of a vast majority of manufacturing goods are not finding a lot of openness. The tariffs uh, are very high in many of these cases. The restrictions uh, in terms of products and intellectual property are make India very much of an outlier in, uh, in the world economy in, in many major respects. The forced localization policies, particularly that we've seen um, implemented most fully in the solar and clean energy area, have really done a lot to limit our access to that market. It has also created a chip, I will say. Yes, there are manufacturers that are invested in India. Yes, there are manufacturers that are selling to India. But there is much more widespread a chill about looking at India as a market as a potential market for sales, as a potential market for investment and future growth because of this panoply of policies they've undertaken. But what I'm wondering about is whether there's an indirect impact over here. You talked about uh, the trade imbalance uh, between the two countries. So I'm wondering, uh, does, uh, do these policies give um, Indian exporters a platform or an advantage uh, in international competition? Absolutely. I mean, you know, just take something as simple as an export tax on raw materials for, uh, that benefits greatly India's steel industry. That acts as a domestic subsidy, as I think this panel might well understand, to make Indian steel exports much more competitive in global markets. Um, that, is, that is something that's a huge concern. It makes it more competitive in our market as well, although we have the ability to use anti-dumping and countervailing duty actions when, you know, on, on those types of uh, unfair activities. You know, in, other, in, in some cases, there are lost export opportunities. In other areas, India is able to export um, in medicines, in equipment, in other areas. Uh, that are in third country markets that are, are costing our manufacturers the ability to grow manufacturing here, the ability to grow jobs here. And we can try to provide some more detail to that in, in written follow-up. If you would, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you, Ms. Shroff, but go ahead and uh, make a comment. Just, then just I can one answer. comment. On the export tax on certain raw materials, I think Ms. Dempsey refers to the iron ore, export tax on iron ore. I think to the best of my knowledge, um, a lot of it mines were actually given to the steel industry on a captive use basis. Uh, these were not actually being used for captive use, but instead being the iron ore was exported. So to stop on that, to stop that export or to make that export more difficult, I think those taxes were imposed. But they were actually meant for one use, but they were being diverted for another use. Thank you. If you can supply any additional information about that in the post here, I'd appreciate it. 
Um, now, turning to you, uh, do you, are there any concerns among your members, Ms. Shroff, uh, about arguably loose patent enforcement in India? I know you talked about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the uh, uh, exaggerations uh, about concerns uh, about patent enforcement in India, but uh, are your members at least in, in part concerned about uh, increasing the uh, level of enforcement in India? Uh, I think the level of enforcement and our members do believe that the level of enforcement for intellectual property in India is very high. As far as copyrights, and trademarks, design uh, rights are concerned and including the patent rights, we are able to secure particular in copyright and trademark all kinds of injunctions as was mentioned at the previous hearing, whether it's a Mareva injunction, a John Doerr injunction, uh, all kinds of injunctions are granted by the courts based on the facts of each case. We follow the same judicial principles that are followed in the United States for grant of interim injunctions. As far as patents are concerned, there are a number of cases, and I could cite a number of cases, which I will in the written testimony, of where injunctions have been granted at an interim stage and these companies have succeeded. So as far as the enforcement in the courts are concerned, I think our courts have been very sensitive. As far as creating the awareness for intellectual property rights is concerned, the Chambers of Commerce have taken very active steps, including the CII, of creating the awareness of what intellectual property rights are and what value they would add uh, you know, to any economy. And training programs have been done, I think I could say at least 30 training programs that the CII has done uh, with Rick for the police officers, for junior magistrates, and I know some programs have also been done for the higher judiciary. So that is a continuous, ongoing, you know, always creating the awareness for intellectual property rights. Thank you. I, I saw some folks in the back row uh, uh, nodding as you were uh, uh, giving a testimony, and I want to give you a chance to comment on uh, Ms. Schroff's testimony, but uh, I, I'd like to get you to uh, focus specifically on the practical issues of enforcement. In other words, not uh, what the laws say, but what's actually happening on the ground. Uh, let's go to the back here. Yeah, so I would take a little bit of a different view. I think that the experience of our members, especially in the preliminary injunction stage, is that it's at best inconsistent. Um, at worst, it's a rare occurrence that they get a preliminary injunction. Um, our experience has been that, you know, largely for access to medicines, quote, access to medicines concerns, that they're usually, those concerns override uh, the legal standards. I think in particular enforcement becomes difficult in the pharma space because their patent law in that space is only created in 2005 with the creation of their, their TRIPS obligations and providing these patents. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve that we've seen in the, in the enforcement and the kind of development of these judicial standards and understanding the various standards of obvious, obviousness, inventive step, and other patentability criteria. And, and we're starting, we're seeing in these decisions kind of disparity between what's going on. Largely, we think on other procedural grounds. Um, I think the second uh, compulsory license case that was overturned is a good example of this, that there is, I think, a tightening of standards here, that there is progress that uh, that case in particular was the, the applicant failed to wait long enough or to even seek uh, a license, uh, at least according to the standards that they laid out and they sent it back. Uh, so, you know, obviously that doesn't preclude them from trying again um, and, and looking for a compulsory license. But um, just to be clear, I think that while the rhetoric has been mainly in this one compulsory license that our experience has been a pattern across you know, across all phases, getting the patent in the first place, getting through pre-grant opposition, getting through post-grant opposition, often by the same parties with the same issues, uh, you know, and then moving on into the courts, uh, failing to get a preliminary injunction in a lot of cases, and then, you know, sometimes winning, and then having a hard time enforcing those judgments when we do win and when we don't win, just, you know, kind of being out of luck. If I could uh, just so, offer the there are industries, uh, this, there, there are particular companies in India that are far ahead of the others in terms of uh, innovation at this point. It's an, it's an evolving marketplace, no doubt. It's the largest generic industry in the world, uh, India. 
and yet there are companies right now that are beginning to, to push on the door of innovation, recognizing very clearly that they need to be evolving standards that are going to protect their IP as, as, as they grow into this industry. I think that's, and, and so the concept of local champions, I, I think is really our best uh, opportunity here. Uh, the more local voices speaking to their government about tightening, tightening section three of the Patents Act, about the protecting the data, that's where we're going to be most effective in our voice. The film industry, uh, from a practical standpoint, uh, the largest uh, film industry in the world, we've heard it mentioned several times in testimony, people like Shah Rukh Khan and others, they want to protect their movies and their creations just as badly as Steven Spielberg and Neil and Bonnie want to protect their joint ventures. So everyone is trying to really work harder on enforcement. It's a matter of public education. And the government is, is, is seized of the issue, and, and industry is certainly, with chambers, working very hard on how do we improve on this. Uh, I appreciate your answer um, I'm at the end of my round, but what I would like to ask the panel is to see if you have any statistics uh, or any uh, uh, hard factual information about what's going on with regard to enforcement uh, in China. Uh, of these uh, patent rights. Okay. I mean, not, uh, 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 with regard to these patent rights. If you have it on China, that'd be good too, but not for this study. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Johansson? Yes, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also like to thank all of the witnesses for appearing here today, especially on this, this IC day. I spent about an hour getting my, getting my car out yesterday, and then I went out this morning and realized I hadn't done a good enough job. It took me about another half hour or so. I arrived in kind of a bad mood, but your testimony is very good this morning. I, I, I got a lot out of it, so I appreciate you putting your, the, the time into it and taking the time to appear here today. My first question is for Mr. Summers. Uh, Mr. Summers, in your statement, you indicated that the situation surrounding U.S.-India trade is essentially healthy, or at least not as bad as often portrayed in this town. Uh, why then the concerns on Capitol Hill over the, the situation involving India? After all, we have a letter, which was a 332 request letter signed by the chairman and ranking members of both the Finance and the Waste Means Committee. I don't know if that's happened in a while. At least I do not recall it ever happening before, at least since I've been in town. Um, and also, as demonstrated by today's witnesses, uh, there indeed do appear to be major concerns by U.S. industries over what is happening in, in India. Can you please comment? Thank you. Yeah, again, I think the, the, the film frame is not as, um, is, is worse than the movie. The movie is a much clearer, better picture, and, and that's the point here. Um, yes, there have been real challenges, uh, particularly since 2011 on retroactive taxation, as I mentioned, the Vodafone case. Some of the challenges that we've seen on intellectual property, the issue of uh, forced localization, which we've seen on solar panels and, and the uh, electronic goods industry, the PMA, the preferential market access policy. I think the culmination of a slowdown in both of our economies uh, and then the elevation of these issues to the forefront have galvanized concern and raised alarm to the extent that for the first time we've seen letters generate, get generated like the one you speak of up on Capitol Hill. Uh, is the relationship overall overall quite healthy? Uh, we spoke to the to the numbers themselves. 2006, 25 billion. Uh, here we are, 2014, 100 billion dollars in two-way trade. Not a bad arc. We remember Arvind Subramaniam's PowerPoint the other day. A lot of graphs going straight up. Trade about even at the very bottom. Uh, Companies having 135,000 employees on the ground in Bangalore, Boeing Corporation selling $20 billion of, of civil aviation aircraft, a defense trade that went from 200 million to 12 billion in 10 years. These are, these are stunning numbers, and yet these recent alarms have come up at a time when we're both coming out of our global recessions, where I think that, that caused concern to the point where we, that we've seen this triggering of, of letters and, and other alarm bells going off. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Summers. Uh, Ms. Dempsey, this, is, this next question is for you. Uh, you had mentioned in your, in your statement that, and as Mr. Summers also mentioned as well, that U.S. sales of aerospace and defense equipment have done quite well in India. Is this due to lack of competition of, in those sectors in India? I know, for example, with, with, with long-range aircraft, you have basically Boeing and, and, and Airbus, the two world producers, major world producers. 
Um, and if that is the case, is that also the, the situation involving other industries where you see industries where there is no major production in, Indi in India, U.S. industries doing well there because of that situation? I think the, the relationship on the aerospace is much more complex and, and does come down to you know the broader strategic relationship of the United States and India that has fostered that type of partnership in the defense aerospace area. Um, you know, other sectors, I think it's 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 a different sort of of issue. Um, but you know, as as I said in my broader testimony, I, there is more deep, widespread concern in a lot of other sectors, fairly widespread. And I think some of the frustration that um, manufacturers in my organization have felt over the last two years is that when these concerns are raised with the Indian government they're pushed aside. That's a small issue, we've dealt with that, we'll take care of that, you're not right, we'll argue about the legal nature of intellectual property protection. As opposed to a mature type of relationship where India wants to succeed, wants to attract foreign investment, not force it through localization measures or other ways, um, not steal intellectual property, but grow its own intellectual property. And I, I take Mr. Summers at his word that there are undoubtedly industries that, that want to do that in India. But what we've not seen at the Indian government level is, frankly, an acknowledgement that they've got a problem here. And there is a problem, and it's a widespread one. If I could just chip in, uh, and, a, and a new government is going to be, I think, helpful in trying to help sort out some of these issues. As to whether the United States enjoys a monopoly or some kind of advantage compared to other international competition, I want to point out that we are very disappointed that 126 fighter aircraft uh, that the government of India was soliciting for their, their air force, uh, their, their military air force, went to the French. So there is real competition out there. Lockheed Martin and, and Boeing, of course, would have enjoyed winning that award. You mentioned Airbus and, and, uh, and Boeing on the civil aviation side. Uh, Embraer from Brazil is another competitor. They just won a major contract today. Um, uh, we're, we're happy to report that Pratt & Whitney and GE engines are selling uh, very aggressively into the market, as are uh, Rolls-Royce. The Indian civil aviation market is really growing at 20% per annum. And um, on, on things like supercritical boilers for power equipment, you know, the real challenge has been the Chinese. They're flooding the market. India, therefore, has raised duties, and that's hurting companies like GE and Siemens and others, uh, the European providers that would normally be selling into that marketplace. <laughs> India's market is needing a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure investment, and the American companies are benefiting by that extraordinary demand. Thank you. Um, this question is for Ms. Shroff. Uh, Ms. Shroff, what concerns do Indian companies share with their U.S. competitors who are operating in India with regard to uh, impediments to running their businesses in the country? Uh, I think one of them, I think one of them would be the number of approvals that are required to be taken to get a business started and keep it going. I think that, and there probably is not a one-stop shop for getting all the approvals to go and start a business and get it going. I think that is one of the largest concerns uh, that is happening. The other is the story of governance, which most people have been hearing over the last maybe more than a year. So I think that is the other concern uh, that the companies would have. Thank you. Um, and this question is for Mr. Zavallin and Mr. Lewis, you all are probably the two folks. And actually, Mr. Nelson as well, the folks most uh, qualified to, to answer this. Do the members in your associations uh, do contract research for firms in India as well as, uh, as other multinationals? And do the regulatory problems you described in your testimony apply equally to both? Uh, the answer to the first question is, is yes, uh, our members do. Um, contract research for uh, pharmaceutical biotech companies uh, wherever, they're, wherever they're located. In large measure, I think the, um, what I described, the situation I described, does affect uh, clinical research for Indian-based companies. Uh, the issue, though, is that with such a large uh, 
um, such a largely generics focused industry, um, it's not having as much an effect as it is on the, the innovator industry where uh, larger trials and more complex trials are needed. Uh, yes, our, our industry definitely does uh, contract for individual research in, in India. Even the aspect of the, the data protection issue that I mentioned, it's quite evident that some of the, the tests that we need to do have to be local. These are environmental fate type tests. So India will have different terrain, different climate, different soil. And those products that we would be hoping to sell into that market have to be tested in those markets. So we definitely do that. I would just add that I think will be on, or much earlier than the clinical trial space. Um, many of our small companies in particular are looking for ways to collaborate with Indian scientists in their universities and to uh, you know, work jointly to develop these molecules. Um, and from a regulatory perspective, I mean, going again to the IP issues, you know, that becomes very difficult uh, to do that, to collaborate with Indian scientists, to work together to develop the next generation of biotech. But could I, could I ask uh, the second part of Mr. Johansson's question, which is, are the Indian companies being discriminated against the same way uh, that American companies are? And I would say, yes, they are. There's, there's a concern that we're, we continue to hear from the Indians that the concern about being treated as a guinea pig. So I'm just curious how you would answer that question. It, it, it's interesting, Ron, because I saw an article a week or so ago that some of the Indian companies are, uh, some of the Indian pharmaceutical companies are taking their trials outside of India. So it, it, it begs the question, so are, are they using you know, US citizens as guinea pigs? It's kind of a, an unusual, uh, perverse uh, twist, I think, on the, on the matter. Yes, Ms. Shroff, and think, we need to wrap up. Right, just in a minute. I think the whole issue of the uh, problems regarding clinical trials has actually arisen because uh, a petition was filed to our Supreme Court of India by Swastya Adhikar Manj in January 2012, pointing out the number of instances of violation of the ethical guidelines in the conduct of the clinical trials. For example, trials were conducted on children mentally challenged persons, adolescent girls, and women in at least three cities in central India, in the state of Madhya Pradesh. In Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh, HPV vaccine trials were done on adolescent girls, resulting in deaths. Proper informed consent was not obtained, and the stories just go on and on. So I think as a reaction to this being brought to the notice of the court, the need and the requirement for bringing in force stricter rules. All right, thank you. Time has expired. I'd like to follow up in the second, second round. But I might add as well, when I was uh, I went to University of Texas Law School, and the student newspaper always had ads for drug testing for, <laughs> for students without enough money to go get drug testing done. So I never took part in that, but I know you know it exists here in the United States as well as in India. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brother. Thank you. I'm at the risk of um, overtiring, Mrs. Frop. Thank you for your good answers. We appreciate it. Um, what can we learn about how the Europeans succeed in India? Um, they have a, you know, I think the Euro Europeans have 45% share of the Indian import market, and we have about, uh, actually that was, that's in 1991, they've got 31% of the European import market in Europe, and compared to the U.S., where we have 6.5% of the import market in India. Um, what do they do that we're not doing? I think take greater risk. Okay. And then, um, uh, if I may add to yes. that, I mean, that sounds a little too short as an answer, but if I may add that, I think probably they have tried to understand how, what India is all about and how it's a nation with, it's several nations within one nation and how to do business in India, as is, I'm sure, all other American companies have done. And second is, Ultimately, business is all about a risk or an appetite for risk. And the rewards and returns are commensurate with the risk that you take. So I think it's a combination of all of that. And this was sort of more be before uh, the crisis and Europe went into a deep depression. I think the Europeans also had a longer history at it. We really only began our engagement 22 years ago. Yeah. Right. Um, and what are you, the first two witnesses, Mr. Summers and Mr. Strzok, what are you hearing about the U.S., I mean, the EU-Indian FTA negotiations? 
to the best of my information, and I did make some inquiries about that, I think that will not happen till the EU ambassador to India has said that it would not happen until the new government is formed and they take stock of the situation. But I think it does call, I mean, as India looks at what's happening in the Atlantic and with Europe and the United States, and as they look to the Pacific and what we're trying to do there with trade, uh, clearly India has to figure out where they want to be in this discussion. And so um, U.S. India Business Council has engaged the Peterson Institute to conduct a deep economic study as to what would a free trade agreement look like in the future, given that it's way early, politically not ready. But, but clearly we need to be working towards structures that help resolve some of these transactional issues. And, and therefore the first step would be a very robust bid. Okay, and what are some of the concrete problems that a, a successful bid negotiation might solve on the ground for U.S. business? I think more than anything, it would be symbolic in the sense that we're already doing a lot of business together on investment. investment. Dispute resolution would be the first and biggest issue. I mean, the, the grindingly slow challenges of the Indian legal system that you've heard so much about, how can we accelerate dispute resolution in a manner where if there is dispute, we can find our way through it. I think that's where a bit would be most advantageous. Plus, the Indians are now investing in a very big way in the United States, so it's to their advantage as well. But as much as anything, confidence building measure. Okay. Other than the, if I may add, other than just the BIT, I think India is also working towards changes um, in its own arbitration act because larger disputes are typically decided in an arbitration and there has been some problems with our arbitration act. The recent decisions of our Supreme Court have substantially cleared the hurdles that uh, we were facing in implementing um, the um, arbitration clauses and how to enforce arbitration agreements. I think that to a large extent has been cleared with, I think, slight tweaks, little tweaks in the Arbitration Act. A lot of the concerns that are expressed uh, on the delay would well be sort of dealt with. And that's on the way. If I might, um, on the bilateral investment treaty, I think from, from NAM's perspective, um, a bilateral investment treaty, if done right, could do a lot of, um, uh, provide a lot of uh, resolution to long-standing problems. It is much more than symbolic, and if all that was achieved was a symbolic and not very deep bilateral investment treaty, that would be a, a huge lost opportunity for um, both our countries, but certainly for manufacturing growth here in the United States since the largest destination for um, U.S. exports overseas is actually the subsidiaries of U.S. companies. And so there is a great tie between U.S. investment overseas and manufacturing. But some of the types of provisions that we have in the U.S. model bit, uh, non-discrimination, the elimination of equity caps, services, manufacturing, et cetera, um, strong rules to prevent uh, unfair, arbitrary government behavior and treatment of investors. Provisions prohibiting performance requirements, provisions that governments always use, and I'm not sure India has ever agreed to these provisions in prior investment treaties, but you know, some governments want to say if you want to increase your investments, you have to say, uh, purchase local input or export a certain percentage or use local technology. Many of the types of issues we're seeing in India right now. And so those types of provisions would be absolutely critical, of course, with the binding investor state dispute settlement as well. You know, many of our European competitors already have. The, there's a UK, India bit. Their risk premium is already lower in India than for, for many US investors. Mr. Simchak. Thank you, Commissioner Robin. Um, on the EU-India FTA negotiations, I would just add that the EU has made a high priority of uh, uh, increasing the FDI cap and insurance as part of the negotiations. They flagged that as an important issue for them. So I think we should definitely watch that to see how that plays out for them and also to make sure that uh, European insurers don't have advantages over U.S. insurers if an EU FTA is concluded before a U.S.-India bid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is for Mr. Nelson from uh, Crop Life, Dr. Nelson. How has India avoided implementing Article 39 of TRIPS, uh, which protects the misuse of proprietary, proprietary testing data? Are they in violation of the Uruguay round, would you say? I think we've made it a point to say that they're very close to that. Uh, 
because if you look at the uh, language of, of 39.3, which I don't have in front of me, unfortunately, uh, which basically says it's an obligation of the member 